Joanna Hambly. I'm an archaeologist. I work with the Scape Trust and the University of St Andrews and I'm a member of SWACS. Today I'm going to be telling you some of the results of our community excavations at the Weems Caves last summer and putting them into a bit of context for you. These excavations were a partnership between SWACS, Scape with contributions by the University of Aberdeen and I'm talking today on behalf of the whole team. The Weems Caves are very well known because of the number of Pictish symbols carved into some of the cave walls and they're one of still only a handful of sites where you find Pictish symbols that aren't megalithic standing stones that we find across eastern Scotland. This model gives you a very good idea of the landscape context of the Weems Caves. They're on the coast and the carvings are found in the caves marked in yellow. Now there has been quite a bit of small-scale archaeological excavations in and around the Weems Caves over the last 40 years and this slide summarises what we know of them. The red are the, are the cave outlines. But of course there's an awful lot that we don't know about, nicely expressed in this letter by James Young Simpson in 1866. So what do we know? Well these diagrams just summarise the archaeological deposits found outside of the Weems Caves. At the base of the sequence we have natural raised beach deposits. Then we have good evidence of Iron Age cultivation and activity in the area. And thereafter a series of deposits, some of them quite thick, some of them containing domestic rubbish which we call midden, um, dating from the Iron Age through to the medieval period. So it's quite a mixed picture, but it shows that people were farming and living here at least from the Iron Age onwards. And there's also been two Christian burials discovered at the Weems Caves, um, just outside of Jonathan's Cave. The only modern excavations carried out inside the caves were those of the Time Team in 2004. In Jonathan's Cave and Well Cave they found only shallow, quite modern deposits that had been disturbed, but they did find medieval pottery inside the Well Cave. In the Sliding Cave, however, which is a bit further away from the villages of East Weems and Buckhaven, and more difficult to get to, the deposits had not been disturbed, and at the base of their test pit they found what they interpreted at the time as a paved floor, and then above it, trampled layer made up of charcoal and cultural material, probably from cooking fires, which were radiocarbon dated to 244 to 388 AD. This evidence was interpreted at the time as reflecting activity that predated the carving of the Pictish symbols at the Weems Caves. Since 2004, there's been a great deal of new archaeological work investigating the archaeological context of Pictish symbols. So I'm thinking particularly of the University of Aberdeen's work with Gordon Noble and the University of Bradford at Kelsey Caves. This recent archaeological work has really helped pin down the chronology of the use of Pictish symbols. And so it seemed like a very, very good time to revisit the archaeology of the Weems Caves and see how they fitted in with this emerging chronology of the development of the Pictish symbol system. Our main objectives were to carry out archaeological investigations inside the two caves that, as far as we know, have never been looked at in the modern period, Cork Cave and Dew Cave and revisit the Slider Cave to find out more about the archaeological deposits found in 2004 and to get more dating evidence from them. So let's jump in and talk about the results of our excavations last summer in the Cork Cave, Dew Cave and Sliding Cave. Starting with the Cork Cave. The red is the scheduled area, the green are the test pits that were excavated Here's uh, some of our excavation team and we're starting 
inside the cave in front of the panel of carvings in test bit three and here's Michael excavating through the highly compacted cave floor. This is a section through the deposits in trench three. We suspected they would be very shallow and this did prove to be the case. So the only deposits that aren't natural are thin layers of highly compacted trample, mainly made up of coal dust. Finds recovered from these layers of trample were modern. Um, they include bits of bottle glass, some wooden fragments that look quite like matches, a little bit of a clay pipe, and what looks like a bit of a leather boot lace. Moving into the entrance of Court Cave in Trench 2, here we have Sue and Diana excavating through equally as compact layers. If we have a look at a close-up of those layers, we can see they're made up of very black, trampled, compacted coal dust interleaved with like clayey inwash. These layers also only contained relatively modern material. And it is very tempting to link these modern layers with the known use of the court cave throughout the late 19th and early 20th century by miners for the gambling game of toss where you throw two pennies up in the air and bet on the outcome. And I like to think of many decades of coal dust from miners' boots being trampled into the cave every time they came off shift and, and were using the, using the cave for, for these games. However, the story doesn't quite end there because right at the base of the trench, just lying on the smooth bedrock floor of the cave, was found this pottery which Derek Hall identified as two fragments from medieval jugs. One is an English import, the other is local Scottish white gritty ware. And these are significant finds because what they're telling us is that Cork Cave was kept very, very clean, probably right up until the 19th century. These fragments of pottery were just uh, survived in hollows in the smooth bedrock floor of the cave. So this cave was used for a whole variety of activities in the past. We know it was used for uh, barking nets because it's, it's known as bark caves in some of the historical accounts where fishermen used to dip their nets in a preservative made from tree bark. We know the cave was used as a meeting place. We know, we know the cave was probably used to stable animals. Um, and so it was just it was a kept, it was a clean working space until relatively recently, and so archaeological deposits just weren't allowed to build up on the cave floor. So let's go just outside the cave mouth to test pit one, um, which is a very deep test pit dug by Chris and Jamie. And their efforts really paid off because unlike the test pits inside the court cave. This one was very deep and full of archaeological material, mostly what we call midden, which is an archaeological term for general rubbish. So it contained a lot of animal bone, shellfish, these are food remains, some pottery, and also evidence of ironworking as well. These deposits had accumulated right on top of a wa the wave cut platform and was mixed with hill wash or colluvium, so that we know it had accumulated over a fairly long period of time. And the dating evidence we um, recovered from it was a 6th to 7th century radiocarbon date from an animal bone on the rock platform, and then medieval pottery higher up the sequence. So that's quite a long time period over which the deposits accumulated, but there was no modern material in it. So we know that it that we know that it hadn't been disturbed. There's been no recent intrusions. So let's have a closer look at the animal bone assemblage. This is a real mix of domesticates and wild animals. Some of the wild animals possibly more important for their pelts, such as seal and otter. And as was the case inside Court Cave, the pottery recovered from this trench is not local. It's another English import. 
This is quite interesting because all of the medieval pottery recovered from other excavations at the Weems Caves have been local. These unprepossessing lumps are the residues from iron working. And they were looked at by Gemma Cruikshanks from the National Museum. And she says, although the pieces are too fragmentary to, dist to distinguish which part of the process they derive from, one fragment is probably bloom, suggesting smelting or primary smithing, bloom refining were taking place. And this is bloom. It's the mass of iron which comes out of the furnace as a product of smelting and it's hammered immediately to bash off some of the impurities and that's what results in fragments of bloom slag. Amongst the pieces we found this cylinder of fired clay which was vitrified at one end and Gemma identified it as a tuyere. So this is the end of bellows used to force air into either a furnace or, or a smithing hearth. And if you put all of our fragmentary evidence together, you can see that we potentially have the bits from this part of the furnace, tuyere, the bloom, and general slag as well, showing that we might have evidence for ironworking inside court cave. And why didn't we find any evidence of metalworking from deposits inside Cork Cave? Well, because as we've seen, it was almost certainly kept very, very clean. And the midden material in the trench just outside Cork Cave, and it literally is just outside, it's, it's in the cave entrance, it almost certainly originates from activities taking place inside the cave. So periodically the cave was cleaned out and the, the material was dumped outside and accumulated on the, on the slope outside the cave. And this is really interesting because although there is quite a bit of evidence for metal working inside caves and rock shelters, they're very well suited for it, there's hardly any evidence that dates to the early medieval period. It's mostly Iron Age. A recent exception to this is the Smelters Cave, which is part of the Rosemarkey Caves complex on the Black Isle, where an in situ smithing hearth has been dated to 600 to 800 AD. And this is a result of the great work carried out by the Rosemarkey Caves project. Our next step at the Weems Caves is to apply thermoluminescence and optically stimulated luminescence dating techniques to the Tuyere itself to try and refine its date. This will give us a date to when the Tuyere was last heated to a very high temperature, so hopefully its last use. It's a bit of a long shot, but we're, we're going to give it a go this year, hopefully. We now go to the Dew Cave, so-called because of the rock-cut nesting boxes found carved in the cave walls. This photograph taken around 1900 shows the Dew Cave when it had its stone blocking in place and you can just see just at the top of it the small openings for the pigeons to fly in and out of. Now the use of caves for pigeons is very well known in the medieval period but specially modified ones like this one are as rare as hen's teeth so we really wanted to know more about it and we were hoping to find medieval deposits that would help us date the the carving of the of the nesting boxes in the Dew Cave. Here's some of our Dew Cave excavation team, Kirsty, Hannah and Tom, and they opened up a big trench in the back of the cave. It was big because we knew we would have to go down quite deep because the collapse of the West Dew Cave in 1914 resulted in lots of material washing into the cave and so we knew we needed to get through that before we were to find any evidence of medieval or earlier deposits. So unfortunately all the deposits turned out to be pretty recent but the excavation did throw up a whole load of new questions. These rows of rock cut niches carved into the floor of the Dew Cave appear to be very similar in fashion to the niches carved into 
the walls of the cave for the pigeon nesting boxes, but there's no way they could have functioned as nesting boxes. Our best guess is that they're supports for a wooden structure, but we don't really understand what sort of structure that would be. Nothing is mentioned in any of the antiquarian accounts, which do include a survey of the Dew Cave in 1890. So whatever it was, w was not visible or surviving by then. A second conundrum was that the primary deposit filling the floor niches was beach sand. And this contained a piece of early 20th century corrugated iron. So this shows that the sea must have come into the cave in the early 20th century and likely washed away all existing deposits. So this marine incursion must have happened after 1900 when this photograph was taken because as you can see the cave was had a wall in front of it then and before the 1950s or 60s when this photograph was taken. But in fact, we need to look no further than the Weems Caves guidebook where Frank Rankin records this event in 1945 when a storm washed away the seawall and the grassy bank in front of the Dew Cave broke down the wall which sealed off the entrance. So the cave is now open to the shore. So it's likely that this event was the beginning of the scouring out of any surviving archaeological deposits inside the Dew Cave. However, we are left with this mystery of the rock cut niches in the cave floor. So if anybody out there knows anything about medieval Dew Caves, we would really like to hear from you. So finally, we go to Sliding Cave, where we were granted scheduled monument consent to excavate two trenches. One of them was re-excavating and extending the Time Team trench and another one a bit further inside the cave to coincide with the rectangle carving found on the cave walls. So these are the two Pictish symbols that we find in the sliding cave. And our primary objective here was to reopen the trench, identify the Time Team layer which was radiocarbon dated to the 3rd, 4th century AD, uh, get more samples from it, and then see if that layer extended further into the cave. Here's Sue and Gordon doing just that, sampling from the original time team layer from Trench 1. And this is Trench 2, following excavation, you can see where it is in relation to the rectangle and double disc symbol on the wall. Both trenches recorded almost identical sequences shown in this section drawing. At the base was a concreted boulder layer. This was interpreted by the time team as a paved surface, which is it's more likely to be natural. Upon this was a layer of trample, which contained cultural material. And after that, you have inwash, natural inwashing material and occasional boulders, probably from occasional roof collapses. The cultural material was made up of trample containing charcoal, animal bone and marine shell. And the main objective was to sample for more dating evidence. So let's look at the results. You can see here that on the left hand side you have the original time team date. And on the right hand side, samples from deposits in 2019 produced a much wider date range from the 1st century AD through to the seven, early 7th century AD. If we plot our dates in stratigraphic order with the pale yellow above and the orange below, you can see there's not a clear chronological sequence. So it's likely that they all built up over the same long period of time. So what this is likely to be telling us is that these trample deposits were built up episodically over that time with people walking in and out of the cave. Maybe there was cooking fires in some areas of the caves or maybe at the cave entrance. And it's just detritus from people's feet treading material in and out of the cave over four or five hundred years. 
every now and again there might be a period of very wet weather where water would ingress into the cave and mix deposits up a bit so essentially these deposits are quite mixed but they're all they all date from the late iron age to the early medieval period remember also that radiocarbon dates give you the probability of a date falling within a specific range so if we look at our probability the absolute vast majority of our dates fall between 50 and 500 AD and if we exclude the outlier all of our dates fall within 50 and 400 AD so as with any scientific dating technique there is a certain amount of interpretation about which dates are more likely than others. To put the results of the sliding cave into some sort of context, we're going first to Dunacare, 20 miles or so south of Aberdeen. And this is a sea stack excavated by Gordon Noble of the University of Aberdeen a few years ago. It was almost certainly previously a promontory fort and it's famous for these Pictish symbols found carved on stone plaques which were discovered at the base of the promontory fort and assumed to have been built into its rampart wall. What's of interest to us at the Weems Caves is the absolute remarkable similarity of the carvings at Dunacare with what we have at Weems. You can see on this slide that in nearly every cave there are some that are almost identical to those that were found at Dunacare. And if we look at the dating from the excavations at Dunacare, the occupation of the site lasted from 200 to 400 AD and the construction of the rampart falls between 285 and 350 AD. Remember the Pictish symbols carved into the stones were almost certainly part of the rampart. So this is very compelling archaeological evidence for the use of Pictish symbols in an archaeological context in the late Iron Age. Now let's go to the only other cave in Scotland bearing Pictish symbols on its walls that has got archaeological dating evidence associated with it, the Sculptor's Cave in Murray. Again, if we compare carvings found in the Weems Caves with those in Sculptures Cave, you can see the remarkable similarity. Look particularly at the arches, the fish, and down in the bottom right hand side, the so-called flower symbol in West Dew Cave and its similarity to the symbol that you can still see in the Sculptures Cave. Sculptures Cave has a pretty grisly archaeological story. In the Bronze Age, thousands of fragments of human bone and offerings uh, show that it was probably used as a mortuary cave in this period. Amongst the human bones were human vertebra with sword cuts through them, resulting from decapitation of at least six victims. And the University of Bradford revisited the archaeological assemblage, assemblage of Sculptor's Cave, and they identified from the vertebra four adults and two teenagers, and they radiocarbon dated the bones and found that in fact they were not Bronze Age, but were likely to have been killed between 220 and 335 AD. Ian Ahmed, who led the research, speculates that the decapitations could have been a single event, possibly an execution or a ritual killing, which took place during the time period within which the historical pics were first mentioned. Although he goes, goes on to say that the symbols carved around the cave entrance passages are unlikely to date much before the 6th century AD. However, in the light of the new dating evidence from the University of Aberdeen's work and the, and the dating evidence from the Weems Caves, it does seem equally plausible 
that the carvings of the symbols in the sculptor's cave were contemporary or near contemporary with the killings. And finally, here's a reminder that the archaeological research process is always that of building on what has come before. This map is from a short article in the Pictish Art Society Journal of 1996 by Leslie Alcock, which is drawing attention to the similarities between the three sites that we've been exploring. Concluding that the differences between the symbols in caves and on the Dunnecare plaques on the one hand, and those on slabs and boulders in the open air on the other, have been treated here as evidence that a varied range of pictographs might be ancestral to the canonical class one symbols. And by the canonical class one symbols, we mean those found on the symbol stones across Eastern Scotland. But you can still see here the similarities in form to what we have in all of the three sites we've been looking at, the double crescent, the fish, the double disc, etc. And our current contribution to this research is the scientific dating and careful archaeological work that is allowing us to unpick the timing and the origin of the first use of Pictish symbols and to better understand the range of circumstances where they were important. You can get more detail about the excavations from the report, which you can download from the Scape Trust website. And I'd encourage you to visit the weemscaves.org website, join SWACS, um, and do some Christmas shopping on their excellent online shop. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, myself and members of the excavation team are available to answer them.